Um, thanks very much for the invitation, Vasilis. Um, first thing, while I, I ask you to stand up for 30 seconds because you've been sitting for 45, so uh, you're going to be listening to me for another 30. Uh, you can move around a little bit. W would you like to adjust the camera or is it fine? Okay, because it's probably taking me from the uh, neck. Okay. Great. Um, so my my talk. Um, oh, actually, you can you can sit down. I, I forgot. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. I mean, all, all of you. Anyway, my my talk sounds quite um, specific when we're talking about a creativity, but I would like you to see it as a case study that hopefully you might find some of the elements we have discussed so far in there and. Um, it starts with a narration about my personal journey for the f first uh, five minutes. Uh, don't think I'm going to be talking about myself all the time. It's just to show you how I ended up doing this. And then we, we get into the keywords um, that we would like to, uh, to discuss about. Um, so um, about 15 years ago, I was on this train. It's, um, it's called the Shinkansen train. It used to be the fastest train on Earth. It's in Japan. And it goes with 310 kilometers an hour. And I thought, while well, I was at the time, I was studying for my, I was doing my postdoc in molecular genetics. And I thought that um, my career resembled a little bit this, this train journey because it was going really fast and I didn't know where exactly I was going to stop. Uh, I had been doing all those things, all those studies for many years. You see, I'm coming from a background in Athens, Greece, where in the late 80s, there was a perception that all the good pupils had to either study medicine or law or, I don't know, economics, maybe full stop. Um, and I was a good student, so there, wasn't, there was this peer pressure that I had to do one of those things at the time, and I did, and I was studying and ex doing well, you know, goes getting great, great marks. But then I reached a point while on, on this train, and I thought, where on earth am I going, and am I happy with what I'm doing? You see, um, when, you, when you assess yourself about how well you're doing into something, you can feel sometimes that you've reached a... Um, an ending point. And I would, you know, while doing research in genetics, probably my professors would give me a 9 out of 10, but I would give myself a 7 out of 10 because I knew that that was the end of it. I needed to do something else. I thought it had to be something more creative. So while at a party um, um, around that time, somebody asked me, OK, Theo, you've, you've spent all this time on, on this work. Can you tell me what is your PhD about? And I said, oh, it's easy. I'm studying the DNA variation on the human XQ22. And um, they didn't ask anything else. Um, th th that was the end of the conversation. So I thought perhaps I hadn't conveyed exactly what I wanted to, uh, to tell them in simple words. And you know what? The Wellcome Trust that was funding the, this PhD was, had put about half a million pounds on this research. So it had to be important. It's just that I hadn't had the means, hadn't been trained how to communicate science in a simple way. And it was a rather important research because I was studying genetic disease and how variation between populations uh, is, is very important about the, the, the study of disease genes. Uh, and then I reached the point, after all this, um, that I thought, okay, um, I'm really fed up with scientific research. I'm going to do something completely different. And at the age of 33, I, I had a second puberty. And um, I thought, I'm going to do everything else other than science. I don't want to see science again in my life. So I thought, okay, let's do this. I've always wanted to become an entrepreneur. I'm going to set up a ship brokering company. Um, this is it. This is what I want to do. Uh, we did set up a ship brokering company. It, it probably has the uh, world's best record in, um, in um, making uh, zero revenue in nine months. When we actually closed it, um, it, it didn't 
you know, it, it was pretty bad. Um, then, okay, 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 I'll do something else. I, I was invited to become the best man of a good friend, a Greek friend who married a Dutch girl. So, you know, in those kind of weddings, you get to do a best man's talk, and I did one, um, and it went relatively well. I mean, the, the, you know, the 10 people laughed. Uh, um, there were about 200 there, and I thought, okay, this is it. I'm going to become a stand-up comedian. This is what I want to do. It's, it's, I have a great sense of humor. Um, it has to be used somehow. So I did a show, uh, chic shows, actually, um, and then, you know, everybody was laughing, all four of the attendees each time. Um, so I thought this is not a career path. And then I knew that it, traveling is education. I've always knew that. So I thought, this is it, I'm going to travel. I had always been traveling, and then I got a, a camera together with a crew, and we did a journey from Athens to Beijing, only that we drove from Athens to Beijing. It took us 35 days. Anyway, basically, I was just looking for what I wanted to do. And um, going back to that party, all this, it took about a year, and it matured into my head. Of course, I was on a shoestring. I didn't have any budget for this. So all this that I'm talking about, it was done on very low budget. And then the opportunity arose. I, was, uh, I attended a competition of science communication organized by the British Council called Fame Lab. We had three minutes to talk about our scientific topic in simple words. I got into that competition. I did relatively well. I reached the finals. I didn't win at the finals, but this was an opening door for me. Um, I could see that by doing this as a career path, there was a, a, an avenue for creativity, an avenue for communication, perhaps for social entrepreneurship, and also I could use my background in science. Hence, I, um, I set up a team of people that we started by doing shows, theatrical shows. We, are, we were all scientists at the time, um, and we wrote shows that were 60 minutes in length, um, you know, explaining topics such as the environmental science, the science of Christmas, as in with regards to all the customs around Christmas, like how fast can, how, how can uh, the Santa Claus travel around the world uh, and deliver the presents in one night? Um, how is this possible? But only if he moves with the speed of light. Um, and then you, you were explaining the theory of relativity in little kids, uh, well, not so little, about the age of 12. But of course, the main element was comedy, because comedy is the most serious form of communication. Um, and this went pretty well. And after this, um, I co-founded Psycho, which I know what it sounds like, but it's... <laughs> yeah. But it was for, it's for science uh, communication. Um, and the motto was to make science simple. So um, for several years, in fact, for most years of Psycho's life, which is about 13 years old, um, we had to explain why it's so important to communicate science. Because some relatively well-known people doubt scientific facts. Um, uh, and we really had to convince, because all the time, you know, people were saying, oh, Theo, you're communicating science. Um, it's so, such a nice thing to do. Um, by the way, yeah, this is the Flat Earth Conference. I have just checked. It's open again. If anybody wants to go this November, there are tickets. Um, so we had to explain all these things. And as I said earlier, it was always nice to have. Until one day, COVID came. And then with all the tragedy that arose from uh, the pandemic, um, this was the, the major boost for science engagement and science communication. It was something unprecedented because all of a sudden, everybody turned to scientists. And scientists became the superheroes, as you can read here in the New York, uh, New York Times uh, in April 2020. So all of a sudden, our work became important. And we didn't have to explain anymore why we're doing what we're doing. Um, how do we operate? Well, there's two main pillars. One is awareness, and the second one is empowerment. These are logos from some of the 200 projects that we've run over the last 
um, 13 years. So I will talk about each pillar separately, and all the projects that I'm presenting here are just ex examples that hopefully you might relate to some of them, uh, and you might want to use some of the concepts behind them. Okay, one basic um, technique to create awareness is to do an event, okay? We, we founded the science festivals in, in, in Greece and in Cyprus, um, are these are pretty big events. They have up to 30,000 visitors in a week. So they're very popular. And you've see, I'm sure you, you've been in one of them. There's all kinds of interactivity in them. Shows, uh, debates, talks, music, um, everything. Okay? It's a multi-factorial, multi-disciplined uh, platform, which works very well. And we've been doing them, as I said, every year in all those cities around Greece, as you can see on the map. Now, okay, before I move on to the second slide, when you want to do an awareness campaign in any industry, in any academic discipline, you need to be aware of one thing. Who attends those events that you're doing? Do you know who attend them? People who are already interested in those events. And this is data from several science festivals. Who visits the Imperial College Festival, Science Festival? Well, mostly people who are already pro-science. So if you wanted to do a campaign about climate change or about pro-vaccination, or something like that, then perhaps this is not the right platform because you're preaching to the converted. So how do you target the other people? How do you target the untargeted? Well, we came up with a concept that we call it guerrilla science. Um, and basically, we go to metro stations, train stations, bus stops, um, airports, even malls, uh, and we meeting the crowds in places they, that they wouldn't normally um, expect to be preached or you know uh, talked about science. And we've been doing this with this project called Mind the Lab, uh, which is after the name Mind the Gap, um, and you can use this for all sort of creative um, uh, topics you would like to uh, to talk about from art installations to interactive STEM um, programs. Of course, this platform, Mind the Lab, is not going to change the world because you only have two to three minutes, um, you know, and it really depends on how trained this, this scientist or this, this player is, um, how trained to, to is to interact and be catchy with the audience. Okay, so with this, within those three minutes, all you can achieve is uh, basically refer those people to something else, to, to a book, to a reference, to go back home and seek something scientific online. Okay, it's a teaser. Now, another way to target this in a more digital format is by using the power of influencers. And we set up this show that we call it Celebrity Science, it's on YouTube. It's, quite, it's, it's going pretty well, actually. We invite a scientist together with a celebrity with impact on social media, and we do this game, which, which is called Celebrity Science. It's like a trivial pursuit game. It's a knowledge game. Of course, it relies on comedy again. And here you see me moderating this um, uh, panel where we have a Greek influencer on, on YouTube, Mike Hughes, he has about 300,000 subscribers, together with a scientist, an astronaut from NASA. And this is filmed and it's on YouTube. This particular episode has about 250,000 views and it's all organic. And there's ep episodes that have about 400,000 views, again organic. Uh, and this is a major achievement, you know, coming from no, no budget on something like this. It's, it really does make a change when something is organic or not. The second pillar that I mentioned, empowerment. 
one thing is to upskill. And who do you upskill? Well, mostly we upskill the trainers. We, we find this is a much more, um, it has a multiplier effect because you empower one science teacher to do their work in a biomatic way, in, the, in an interactive way. Your, your funding finishes, but they're upskilled. They can do it for life. So even if you don't have any more money to pay them, you know, they continue. So uh, I'll show you some projects on this area. Okay, this is a, um, a five year so far a project that we've been doing together with the Vodafone Foundation. And we've been going to all the remote areas in Greece. We empower the teachers. And, and basically, what does empowerment mean? I learned science, I learned physics when the physics teacher was drawing a um, was drawing oscillation on a blackboard with a chalk. But if the STEM educator relates that oscillation with the bridge that is moving wh while you're stepping on it, then it makes much more sense. It connects to real life and students never forget about this. So this is what we're talking about, to actually connect science to real life examples. And, and here you can see the remote areas that we've been to so far, doing those STEM labs. And we, since January uh, this year, we started doing it uh, in Albania as well, all around the country. In fact, it was probably one of, of, um, of our highlights, the fact that this started as a co corporate social responsibility project for Vodafone, Greece and Albania, and it became the, the marketing campaign. And this is important when, when a, a large corporation adopts a project which empowers people um, uh, in, in STEM or STEAM as a marketing campaign. Um, so far, 610 projects have been made. Um, and you can see some examples here. One example is this kid with the, the Googles. He made them for his blind grandmother. They have sensors and they can detect objects up to the knee level, so they, they bleep to the ear of the grandmother. Then you can see a drone that was made by a team of students in the island, remote island of Kalimnos, which is a pharmacy drone. And because it's, it's not very accessible to drive to all the areas of the island, they can just use, use the, the mobile phone and call the drone to, to bring the medicines wherever they are within minutes. All, all the projects, and also there's another one with a the glove uh, they made for uh, uh, people who have a uh, speech impediment and it converts the, the movement of the hands into text. So um, these are projects that are not going to go to the market. Perhaps they exist already. However, this is not the point. The point is that you go to remote communities, you engage um, the teachers, the students, and their families, you, you cultivate creative thinking, problem solving, teamwork, and then you create systemic change. Now, regarding community engagement, to go a little bit deeper, this is one of, of our favorite projects. There is an area in north eastern Greece, which is in the borders of, of Greece and Bulgaria, called the Pomax. Um, the Pomax is a population of Slavic origin, however, the ones that live in, in Greece are Greeks for the last hundred years. They have their own language, their own religion, and they live in a very mountainous area. So they are geographically, but also culturally isolated. As a result, the teenagers, the boys, hardly ever finish school, and they go to do all kinds of dirty jobs um, in Europe, jobs that, you know, other people wouldn't do. Um, they work in factories, they work in toxic kind of environments. And the girls, if you judge by the fact that in the, um, the so-called high schools of second opportunity, uh, which are attended by girls who are on average, average age about 30 years old, most of them, they have kids who are 15 or 16 years old. So basically, those ladies, they left school when they were 12, and two years later, they had kids. So um, 
in order to try and connect this community together with the rest of, of Greece and the areas, um, we basically empowered again the, the science teachers and we brought those kids together with the kids from the, re from the surrounding cities. So they started working together in workshops on environmental science. And as a result, we're using science empowerment as a language for cultural bridging. And this was, um, this was uh, given an award by National Geographic and it's still running, so we should have a documentary by the end uh, of September. Um, this is a poem, a girl going to school. Okay. Um, now, I'll, I'll switch to a different project. You m might be familiar with the term citizen science. It's one of the most engaging ways to uh, get the citizens on board a scientific project. Citizen science, you basically uh, uh, recruit uh, volunteers to become data collectors in your project. Um, I will show you again another example from some remote island again. You all know of the island of Santorini. However, right next to it, there's a little, tiny little island called Thirasia. Um, this has probably about 150 inhabitants, and the school has about 20 kids. This is one of the areas where we went, and basically we, we helped the, the kids make an application, a, a, a mobile app, which um, maps all the paths, all, all the trails that you can use in order to walk around the island. And together, you, w the, the citizens of the island participate into adding all the important points uh, of, of the island, all, all the monuments of the island, um, and they add the narratives around them. So there is a church and there's, the, there's a story around this church. The local citizen, the local priest, the local whoever will p get on the app and write a story um, matching that particular, uh, uh, that particular church. In, th in this example, you have community engagement again um, together with, with a scientific project. Now, another topic you can use STEM for. It, this is a project called STEM for Equality. And basically, it has to do with, with the battle that we're trying to, to do with, with women in science. And we decided to hit at a very early age. And this program is running in kindergartens. So we go to kindergartens and we're trying to, to break this perception that uh, girls are playing with dolls and, and boys are playing with trains. So we make them all engineers. Uh, the aim is not to actually create an army of engineers at the age of 18, but to cultivate a, a, um, a scientific way of thinking, a rational way of thinking, a problem-solving way of thinking. Now, getting on to STEAM, I have a couple of examples too. One is very recent. Uh, we, we actually uh, initiated it three days ago, again on one of the islands. This is a program that we just launched on circular economy. Um, and here you can see the, the project that the, uh, the uh, pupils made. It's a greenhouse which is smart and sustainable. Um, they've used a lot of the bottles that the island uses to drink water. So they're reusing the bottles. But also they, we, we taught them how to, to code. And they've put on a lot of sensors that they measure uh, humidity of the ground, of the soil, humidity of the air, um, and temperature. As a result, they're using the water which is coming from all the air conditioning units of the school. And when the humidity sensor of, of the soil says, okay, we have low water, then it automatically initiates watering the plants. It also has a solar panel, of course, and there is a combust um, uh, device right next to it as well. So in a sense, we taught all the basic elements, some of the basic elements of circular economy on a project. Now, this is a STEAM project. 
Um, I'm, I'm getting there if you're getting tired. It, I only have another four or five minutes. This is a STEAM project. These girls, rather than um, go and create solar panels uh, in order to, 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 uh, to collect the energy, they thought, how about if we do it in a more natural way, in a more artistic way? And they, made, they 3D printed this tree and then each one of the leaves of this tree is a little solar panel. Uh, this was one of the winners at a, at a great competition in the US. Um, and I think it's an amazing project because it combines a, a artwork together with science. You see, th there's this new trend you will see in a lot of exhibitions, all this um, AI-generated uh, science and arts imaging. Um, and as we will discuss later, this new trend um, has also arisen because all these things, the, especially the visual stuff, uh, it's much more easy to comprehend, but also it's so much more Instagrammable. <laughs> okay, this is my uh, final slot. How many uses of a paper clip can a um, five-year-old kid find? Thirty. Anybody else? Well, it's one hundred fifty-three um, on average. How about a 10-year-old? It's about half of that. This is an actual study which took place in the late 60s. And how about an adult? It's about one, two, three. Um, so kids use it as a soldier to play, as a clip for the, uh, for the uh, shirt. And so many different things they can use it for. So what happens is that as we grow older, our creativity declines. And why does this happen? It happens because, I call it, because of the social software that we input into the babies. All the babies are, are born scientists. They're the best scientists. They use all of their five senses in order to experiment and do things. But the, um, and then the, the older they grow, um, we tell them, oh, don't do that. Oh, you should do this this way. Uh, and then creativity diminishes as, as we grow older. So um, there's many ways to uh, talk about and maintain creativity to some degree. I'm not going to give the answers here because we have a panel to discuss later on. Uh, so. Um, Thank you. This one. So, Theo, thank you very much. It has been, I hope, really inspiring. Um, as I said earlier on, we have been um, following through what uh, Psycho has been doing for the last year, and we um, um, we wanted to show you their activities because I think um, STEAM education is uh, not that developed and I think we can get inspired and, and see the ways that we can incorporate arts into education and how we can penetrate into the curricula but also how we can find funding and um, maybe also in the next sessions uh, you will discuss such things but also I should tell you that uh, most of these activities are funded by the private sector. This is one thing that wasn't kind of clear, I think, and it's really important. So it's really great, crazy that a, a company like Psycho is thriving and it's financed by the private sector. And um, that's why I also thought it's really important to, to share how they function and what they do. Thank you very much.